The sack of Rome in 410 AD marked a pivotal moment in the decline of the Western Roman Empire. This event, which shocked contemporaries and reverberated throughout history, revealed the empire's vulnerability and signaled its weakening grip on power. Beyond its immediate impact on the city of Rome itself, the sack carried profound religious, political, and cultural implications, shaping the course of events in the late Roman world and leaving a lasting legacy that would be discussed for centuries to come. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's a great thing to have you with me again. If you'd like to support the channel, perhaps follow the links to the Patreon. Otherwise, like, comment and subscribe if you feel inclined to do so. Now without further ado, let's get on with the video. The 410 AD Sack of Rome Let's start from the beginning, shall we? How did we get? To this point. Over four centuries, the Germanic tribes underwent profound transformations due to their interaction with the Romans. Population growth, economic development, and the consolidation of tribal alliances gradually enhanced their ability to challenge Roman authority. Among these tribes, the Goths emerged as prominent actors, engaging in recurrent conflicts with the Roman Empire. While Gothic incursions into Roman territories had occurred periodically since 238, the advent of the Huns in the late 4th century escalated the pressure on the Germanic tribes, compelling many to seek refuge within the Roman Empire. In 376, led by Fritigern and Alavivus, the Therving Goths sought sanctuary in the Eastern Roman Empire, facing adversaries such as starvation, oppression, and administrative corruption. These challenges fueled discontent, leading to widespread rebellion and looting throughout the Eastern Balkans. The culmination of this unrest was the decisive Battle of Adrianople in 378, where Fritigern achieved a significant victory over the Roman Emperor Valens. They even managed to kill the Emperor on the battlefield. Well, despite this triumph, tensions persisted between the Goths and the Romans leading to further conflicts such as the Battle of the Frigidus in 394, where Gothic aspirations clashed with Roman interests, a grim foreshadowing of future confrontations. Nonetheless, among all of this, peace was eventually established in 382, when Theodosius I, the new Eastern Roman Empire, signed a treaty with the Thervings, who would later be known as the Visigoths, granting them autonomy within the empire as Foederati, special subjects of the Romans. Yet underlying tensions continued to simmer, and those tensions set the stage for subsequent clashes between Gothic leaders and Roman authorities. Following the death of Theodosius on the 10th of January 395, the Visigoths regarded their 382 treaty with Rome as more or less null and void. In fact, they also regarded this as a treaty with Theodosius, rather than Rome itself. Alaric, 
swiftly mobilized his forces and led them back to their territories in Moesia. Rallying most of the federated Goths in the Danubian provinces under his command. Without hesitation, he rebelled against Rome, launching an invasion of Thrace and advancing towards the eastern Roman capital of Constantinople. Concurrently, the Huns had launched an invasion of Asia Minor, further destabilizing the region. The Romans simply could not fight on that many fronts, especially against that many, quote-unquote, barbarians. The political upheaval caused by the death of Theodosius further exacerbated the situation. His sons, Honorius and Arcadius, were proclaimed emperors of the Western and Eastern Roman Empires, respectively. But they were young and in serious need of guidance. A power struggle then ensued between Stilicho, who asserted his guardianship over both emperors from the West, and Rufinus, the Praetorian prefect of the East, who assumed guardianship of Arcadius in Constantinople. Stilicho claimed that Theodosius had appointed him as sole guardian on his deathbed, granting him authority over both the Eastern and Western empires. Well, of course, it was rather hard to claim Stilicho was wrong with this, as Theodosius had conveniently passed away, and with his dying word clutching the hand of his best friend ever, Stilicho, said, It is all yours, friend, everything. Well, not many people really believed this. In an attempt to resolve the crisis, Rufinus engaged in negotiations with Alaric, of all people, to persuade him to withdraw from Constantinople, possibly by offering him territories in Thessaly. Consequently, Alaric, after reviewing the terms, decided to redirect his forces away from Constantinople and towards Greece where he conducted raids in the Diocese of Macedonia. Responding to the escalating threat, the Magister Utruisque Militae, Stilicho, led a combined Western and Eastern Roman army out of Italy to confront Alaric and the Goths head on. Eventually, Finding Alaric entrenched behind a circle of wagons on the plain of Larissa in Thessaly, Stilicho opted for a prolonged siege, rather than engaging in a direct conflict. However, Arcadius, influenced by anti-Stilicho factions, ordered Stilicho to withdraw from Thessaly immediately. Further, complicating the situation. Upon receiving the orders from Emperor Arcadius, Stilicho complied by redirecting his eastern troops to Constantinople and leading his western forces back to Italy. The eastern troops, under the command of the Gothic leader Gainas, arrived in Constantinople where they encountered Rufinus, who was subsequently assassinated in the November of 395. The specific circumstances surrounding Rufinus's death, whether orchestrated by Stilicho, or perhaps by Rufinus' successor, Eutropius, remain a little uncertain. But you, dear listener, can engage in your own speculation, just as I engage in mine. 
Now, Stilicho's withdrawal from Greece allowed Alaric to embark on a devastating campaign, plundering several prominent Greek cities, including Piraeus, Corinth, Argos, and Sparta. Indeed, Sparta were not as tough as they used to be. Now, Athens managed to avoid destruction by paying a ransom, so they got off pretty easily. Stilicho returned to Greece in 397, bolstering his army with primarily barbarian allies, hoping for a warmer reception from the Eastern Roman government. After engaging in some skirmishes, Stilicho laid siege to Alaric at Floe, but ultimately he retreated to Italy, and Alaric marched straight into Epirus. The reasons behind Stilicho's failure to decisively deal with Alaric are another subject of debate. Now, some argue that Stilicho's predominantly barbarian army proved to be unreliable, while others suggest that pressure from Arcadius and the Eastern government compelled his withdrawal. Alternatively, there are claims that Stilicho struck a deal with Alaric and betrayed the interests of the East. Well, regardless... Stilicho's actions ultimately led to his designation as a public enemy in the Eastern Empire in the same year. Alaric's successful incursion into Epirus prompted the Eastern Roman government to negotiate him, with him rather, in 398, offering him the title of Magister Militum per Illyricum and granting him authority over the Roman command in his designated province. It's a pretty good deal. Meanwhile, Stilicho, that very popular general, suppressed a rebellion in Africa in 399, allegedly instigated by the Eastern Roman Empire. He also solidified his hold on power in the West by arranging the marriage of his daughter Maria to the eleven-year-old Western Emperor Honorius. Aurelianus, the newly appointed Praetorian Prefect of the East, following Eutropius's execution, revoked Alaric's title to Illyricum in the year 400. In a riot at Constantinople on the 12th of July of the same year, between 700 and 7,000 Gothic soldiers and their families were massacred. Gaianus, previously made Magister Militum, rebelled, but was killed by the Huns under Uldin who sent his head back to Constantinople as a grim offering, and a political statement, no doubt. Feeling vulnerable in the East, and isolated from Roman officialdom due to these events, Alaric seized the opportunity while Stilicho was occupied with repelling an invasion of Vandals and Alans in Raetia and Noricum, Alaric led his people into Italy in 401, reaching it in November with surprisingly minimal resistance. The Goths then captured several unnamed cities and laid siege to the western Roman capital of Mediolanum. Stilicho now bolstered by Allen and Vandal Federates, relieved the siege, compelling a crossing at the Ada River. Alaric then retreated to Palentia, where a drawn-out encounter ensued. On Easter Sunday, the 6th of April, 402, 
Stilicho initiated a surprise attack, resulting in the Battle of Polentia, which ended inconclusively. Results notwithstanding, Alaric retreated once more, leading to further confrontations, including the Battle of Verona, where poor old Alaric suffered defeat and was besieged in a mountain fortress, sustaining significant losses. As desertions played Alaric's ranks, including some prominent figures like Saurus deserting to the Romans, Alaric withdrew his forces to the borderlands adjacent to Dalmatia and Pannonia. In response to the near capture of Mediolanum, Emperor Honorius relocated the western Roman capital to Ravenna, which was a much more defensible position. This shift may have redirected the western court's focus towards Italy's defense, potentially weakening the empire's overall position. Alaric, through certain better choices perhaps, eventually aligned himself with Stilicho, agreeing to assist him in claiming the Praetorian prefecture of Illyricum for the Western Empire. In 405, Stilicho appointed Alaric as Magister Militum of Illyricum. However, Radagasius's invasion of Italy that same year disrupted their plans. Although Radagasus was defeated in 406, Stilicho's subsequent attempts to support Alaric's invasion of Illyricum were thwarted by internal revolts in Gaul, and a reconciliation with the Eastern Roman Empire in 408, signaling a shift in Alaric's significance to Stilicho and Rome. A significant shift occurred in the Eastern Roman Empire with the death of Emperor Arcadius on the 1st of May, 408, succeeded by his young son, Theodosius II. Emperor Honorius initially contemplated travelling east to ensure his nephew's succession, but Stilicho had persuaded him to remain in the west, while Stilicho himself undertook the task. However, Stilicho faced internal opposition, fueled by false accusations spread by Olympius, a Palatine official and Stilicho's adversary. Alleged allegations surfaced that Stilicho aimed to elevate his son Eucarius to the eastern throne, leading to widespread unrest and mutiny among the Roman soldiers, who targeted Stilicho's supporters. Despite efforts from his barbarian troops to quell the mutiny, Stilicho opted for a diplomatic resolution, and journeyed to Ravenna to meet with Emperor Honorius. Do remember that Ravenna was the new capital. They changed that from Mediolanum. Well, unfortunately for Stilicho, Emperor Honorius was quite swayed by these rumours of treason. And after much consideration, he decided to order Stilicho's arrest. Bad luck, I suppose. Seeking sanctuary in a church in Ravenna, Stilicho was eventually persuaded to leave under a false assurance of safety, only to be arrested and promptly executed on the 22nd of August, 408, at Honorius's command. Stilicho's demise abruptly halted the payment to Alaric and his Visigoths, who had not received 
any portion of the agreed-upon ransom. Stilicho, known for his mixed vandal and Roman heritage, is widely acknowledged for stabilizing the Roman Empire during his 13-year tenure, and ultimately his untimely death had far-reaching consequences for the Empire's stability. Oh, and he must have been rolling in his grave too, because shortly after his death, his son Eucarius was also executed in Rome. Can't choose your family, huh? Well, with Stilicho removed from power, Olympius assumed a prominent role in the government, purging Stilicho's supporters and spearheading an anti-Germanic agenda. This shift in leadership led to indiscriminate violence against allied barbarian Fodorati soldiers and their families within Roman cities, and it wasn't the first time prompting thousands to flee Italy and seek refuge with Alaric in Noricum. While the exact number of refugees is uncertain, estimates vary, with some historians suggesting that Zosimus misinterpreted his sources, leading to an exaggerated figure of 30,000 refugees. In an attempt to negotiate with Emperor Honorius, Alaric requested hostages, gold, and permission to relocate to Pannonia. But his demands were quite swiftly rejected. Undeterred, Alaric, cognizant of Italy's vulnerable defences following Stilicho's death, launched his invasion in early October, approximately six weeks after Stilicho's execution. He also enlisted the support of his brother-in-law, Atalf, urging him to join the incursion with reinforcements as soon as possible. Advancing southward, Alaric and his Visigoths pillaged cities along their route, including Arminium. Their march proceeded leisurely, with reportedly an air of festivity, as noted by historian Zosimus. Apparently they were having quite a great time. Meanwhile, Saros and his contingent of Goths opted to remain neutral and distant from the unfolding events within Italy. The monumental city of Rome, possibly housing up to 800,000 inhabitants at this time, found itself under siege by Alaric's forces of Visigoths in late 408. Absolutely unthinkable for people who were citizens of Rome. Well, amidst all of the chaos, panic of course, gripped the population, prompting an effort to revive pagan rites as a defense mechanism against the Visigoths. Remember, at this time, it had only been around 80 or so years that the empire had become Christian. I believe the Edict of Milan from memory was 313. And many people faced the persecutions in the wake of that. Well, now people were thinking perhaps the gods of the old times were angry with them. I'm sure Grandpa was definitely screaming that out. <laughs> well, that's once again speculation, my imagination that runs wild. Well, even Pope Innocent I reluctantly agreed to these rites to bring back a little bit of paganism to try and stem the tide of the Visigoths, some divine intervention, albeit he did these under strict conditions. 
Well, however, the attempt was thwarted by logistical challenges raised by the pagan priest, leading to its abandonment. So unfortunately, no mass-scale sacrifices and pagan rituals. Now, within the city, suspicion fell upon a certain Serena. That was the wife of the deceased Stilago, and the cousin of Emperor Honorius. She was erroneously believed to be colluding with Alaric. Interpret that however you will. Gala Placidia, Emperor Honorius's sister, also found herself trapped in Rome. Unfortunately for Serena, she was ultimately executed by the Roman Senate. Well, this made tensions even worse. People were starting to get a little bit frightened. And the walls of Rome, well, perhaps you couldn't see the Visigoths, but you could certainly hear them with their strange language outside, planning your doom. They're right outside the gate. They're going to get in. As the siege persisted, the city's plight only worsened with Alaric's control over the Tiber River, which severely restricted the inflow of essential supplies. With dwindling provisions, starvation and disease ravaged the population. Reportedly, the streets were strewn with corpses. In a desperate bid to negotiate terms, the Roman Senate dispatched envoys to Alaric, but their attempts were met with derision. Ultimately, Rome had no choice, and they capitulated to Alaric's demand, relinquishing a vast amount of wealth, including gold, silver, clothing and spices, in exchange for not being killed. It's not a bad deal, I suppose. The influx of barbarian slaves further bolstered Alaric's ranks. To gather the required funds, Roman senators were compelled to contribute, resorting to the melting down of pagan statues and shrines. Despite the ransom payment, the scars of Rome's humiliation lingered, symbolized by the melting down of statues that once embodied Roman valor. Emperor Honorius reluctantly approved the payment, prompting Alaric to withdraw his forces to Etruria in December 408, marking an end of the siege. And now for the second siege. <laughs> of course, the first siege was such a success they had to have a sequel, right? Well, in January 409, the Roman Senate dispatched an embassy to Emperor Honorius at Ravenna, advocating for a diplomatic resolution with the Goths. They proposed offering Roman aristocratic children as hostages to Alaric, seeking to restore the alliance between Rome and the Visigoths. However, influenced by Olympius, Honorius rejected the proposal, and instead called upon five legions from Dalmatia to reinforce Rome. Dalmatia was in the province of Egypt. Led by Valens, these forces were intended to garrison the city, but were intercepted by Alaric's army en route, resulting in near annihilation. Following this debacle, a second embassy, including Pope Innocent I himself, was dispatched to plead with Honorius to accede to the Visigoths' demands. Meanwhile, Reports arrived that Atalf, Alaric's brother-in-law, had crossed the Julian Alps with Gothic reinforcements. 
Honorius mobilized Roman forces in northern Italy, placing three hundred Huns under Olympius's command to intercept Atalf. Despite an engagement near Pisa where Olympius claimed victory, he was ultimately forced to retreat, and he ended up back in Ravenna with everybody else. Olympius's failure led to his downfall, with Jovus, the Praetorian prefect of Italy, assuming power and engineering a mutiny in Ravenna. With Jovius's ascension, the new government became amenable to negotiations with Alaric, given Jovius's prior association with Stilicho, and a somewhat lukewarm friendship with Alaric. Alaric presented his demands. He wanted annual tribute, territorial concessions, and the title of Magister Utriusque Milite. Despite Jovius's attempt to broker a compromise, Honorius rebuffed the proposal, sending an insulting response to Alaric. Alaric did not like this. Infuriated by Honorius's rejection of his terms, Alaric terminated negotiations completely. This prompted Jovius to reaffirm his allegiance to the Emperor and swear never to entertain peace with Alaric. Meanwhile, Honorius, resolute in his decision for war, was rumoured to be recruiting Huns to combat the Goths. Alaric, upon hearing this, modified his demands, relinquishing his previous requests for Roman office and gold tribute, now seeking only lands in Noricum and grain supplies deemed necessary by the emperor. However, Honorius's government, bound by its commitment to war and distrustful of Alaric's intentions, once again rejected this offer. Unimpeded by the promised Hun reinforcements, Alaric resumed his siege of Rome, renewing to the city's sufferings from starvation and disease. As conditions deteriorated, the Senate convened with Alaric, who demanded the appointment of a rival emperor to Honorius. In response, the elderly Priscus Attalus was elected, allowing himself to be baptized as a Christian, and bestowed the title of Magister Utriusque Milite upon Alaric. With his brother-in-law Adolf appointed comes Domesticorum Equitum. A new governor under Attalus was established, lifting the siege. Heraclion, governor of Africa, remained loyal to Honorius, resisting Attalus's attempts to subdue him. Attalus and Alaric advanced to Ravenna, coercing several cities in northern Italy to pledge allegiance to Attalus. In a desperate attempt to salvage his position, Honorius dispatched emissaries, including Jovius, to negotiate with Attalus. Jovius, who deflected to Attalus's side, advocated for Honorius's removal from power, but was swiftly rebuffed. As tensions continued to escalate, Honorius contemplated fleeing to Constantinople, only to be bolstered by the arrival of 4,000 Eastern Roman soldiers to defend Ravenna. Meanwhile, Heraclian's victory over Attalus's forces in Africa heightened the threat of famine in Rome, prompting Alaric's desire to send Gothic soldiers to secure the province, an offer once again refused by Attalus. Advised by Jovius to dispose of Attalus, 
Alaric ceremonially stripped him of his imperial title and regalia, reopening negotiations with Honorius in the summer of 410. In an attempt to negotiate, Honorius arranged a meeting with Alaric outside Ravenna. However, before the rendezvous could take place, Sarus, now allied with Honorius and harboring immense animosity towards Atalf, launched a surprise attack on Alaric and his men with a small Roman force. The motivation behind Sarus's aggression, speculated by some historians like Peter Heather, may have stemmed from his defeat to Alaric in the 390s election for the kingship of the Goths. Perhaps so. A little jealous, it seems. Well, Alaric, surviving the ambush, incensed by this betrayal and disillusioned by previous failed negotiations, abandoned further attempts at reconciliation with Honorius. Instead, he turned his attention back to Rome, initiating its third and final siege. On the 24th of August, 410, the Visigoths breached the Salarian Gate and entered the city of Rome, beginning three days of pillaging. Numerous prominent structures including the mausoleums of Augustus and Hadrian, were looted, picked clean, with urns containing the ashes of past emperors scattered on the ground. The Goths plundered movable goods throughout the city, sparing only a few locations such as the basilicas of Peter and Paul. Albeit, offering a significant silver giborium from the Lateran Palace. Although much of the structural damage was confined to the vicinity of the old Senate House and the Salarian Gate, where the gardens of Sallust were burned and left unreconstructed, the Basilica Amelia and the Basilica Julia also fell victim to the flames. The sack of Rome left its inhabitants devastated, with many Romans taken captive, including notable figures like Emperor Honorius's sister, Galla Placida. Some captives were ransomed, while others faced the grim fate of being sold into slavery or subjected to worse forms of violence depending on their gender. The calamity of was recounted in detail by survivors like Pelagius, a Roman monk from Britain, who described it as chaos and despair that engulfed the once mighty city. Accounts of torture and brutality emerged, such as the ordeal of St. Marcella an 85-year-old woman known for her piety and simplicity of life. When confronted by marauding soldiers demanding gold, Marcella, living in humble poverty, had nothing to offer but her modest attire. Despite her innocence, she was mercilessly beaten and eventually succumbed to her injuries. The barbarity of the sack contrasted with moments of humanity as recounted by St. Jerome, who detailed how Christ softened the hearts of the attackers, allowing for acts of compassion amid the violence. Although the sack was relatively restrained by standards of the time, with no widespread slaughter or enslavement, the city suffered significant losses. However, the basilicas of Peter and Paul were designated as places of sanctuary, offering at least some respite during the chaos. 
and despite the devastation, Rome's monuments largely survived intact, albeit stripped of their internal treasures. The aftermath saw waves of refugees fleeing to regions like Africa and Egypt, seeking safety and shelter. Yet, even in their plight, some of them faced exploitation and mistreatment. The historian Procopius recorded a poignant anecdote, illustrating Emperor Honorius's initial confusion upon hearing of Rome's fall. Mistaking the news for the demise of his beloved pet chicken, who he had apparently named Rome. This anecdote star serves as a stark reminder of the absurdity and folly that often accompanies these tragedies in history. While the Visigothic invasion of Italy under Alaric marked a significant turning point in the decline of the Western Roman Empire, the sack of Rome in 410 revealed the empire's vulnerability and weakness, shocking people across both halves of the empire who always viewed Rome as the eternal city and the symbolic beating heart of their domain. The event sparked mourning and reflection with the Eastern Roman Emperor Theodosius declaring three days of mourning in Constantinople, and figures like St. Jerome expressing grief and disbelief. But the sack of Rome also served as a focal point for religious and political conflict within the empire. Christians and pagans alike interpreted the event through their respective world views with some viewing it as divine punishments for the city's sins, and others seeing it as evidence of weakness brought about by the decline of traditional Roman virtues in the face of the new religion of Christianity. In the aftermath of the sack, figures like St. Augustine penned influential works such as The City of God, which sought to reconcile the event with Christian theology and provide a framework for understanding the role of religion in the decline of empires. The sack of Rome was not merely a singular event, but rather a culmination of terminal problems that faced the Western Roman Empire, including domestic rebellions, external invasions and the increasing disloyalty of the Roman army. And it didn't end in 410. Subsequent sacks and invasions, such as those by the Vandals in 455, further weakened the empire until its ultimate collapse in 476. Marking the end of the Western Roman Empire and the beginning of the Middle Ages in Europe. And with that, it marks the end of our video for today. Did you learn something? Well, I just hope that your part of the world is not invaded by Visigoths any time soon. Fingers crossed. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad Patreon, Stark Factory, for his glorious contribution. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you, dear listener, for listening so far. If you've enjoyed it so far, why not like the video, leave your comments down below, and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you hit the bell as well. Apparently people aren't getting all of the video notifications come up. But until next time, I wish you all the best. Look after each other. Drink plenty of water. Good night, everyone.